Hello, I assume we are streaming. I'm going to quickly check if we are online. And if this is the case, we will uh, do a bit of sanding, a bit of polishing, a bit of prep, and lots and lots of masking. We just need a couple of minutes to sort out our windows and whatnot. I do absolutely love my new setup. A bit of polishing, a bit of prep, and lots and lots of masking. There we go. As you can see, we are streaming live. Got the chat up, got the window up, got our uh, beautiful work set up. Enough of uh, this crap. We will get straight into the work. So, what I did last night is prime and start a painting the figure and I'm also going to be working a bit on my YouTube content today as well so there'll be times that I'll take a break I'll pull the webcam out and I'll be talking to the uh, camcorder and there'll be times when I'll be uh, talking to you and uh, reacting to the uh, chat I've advertised this on Facebook, so if we're lucky, uh, this uh, strange hour of the morning, we shall have uh, a bit of an audience. Now, the mistake I made with this uh, kit last night is I primed it with uh, Tamir uh, Lacquer. And uh, Tamir Primer does not react too well to resin. It uh, fish eyes easily uh, and causes all sorts of problems. And most of it I actually did okay. Uh, the flesh I just need to do a bit of polishing. The rest of it um, is awesome. The sword came out very, very appalling. So what I'm going to do is with a bit of uh, wet sanding, I'm going to sand it back a bit and uh, reprime it um, after I go off the stream uh, at a later date when I have... Uh, sorted some stuff out. I will stream and airbrush at the same time. I just need to hook up my uh, tablets to a power source so I can see the chat over there and remove my mask and put it back on to talk and interact. I imagine that the airbrush extremes will not be as interactive but it should be pretty interesting. Um, I've got a nasty spider bite there so please uh, don't mind that. Anyway What's happened is we've got a couple of lumps, um, a bit of fisheye here, and uh, just some inconsistencies on uh, the flat bit. Uh, the raised and detailed bits are pretty good. So if I'm really lucky, I can just uh, remove the raised bits with sandpaper and then polish it, and it won't go down to raw um, resin. And then that way I could just keep the existing um, layer of paint on it, and I won't have to do extra work. So that's going to save me a uh, ton of effort. There is a lump here. Uh, the lump here is uh, the magnet. I don't care that's going to be exposed because that's going to be uh, covered up. Um, I've just exposed some resin here. So she's definitely going to need to be um, reprimed. So we may as well go balls to the walls. And keep going, I suppose. So that was very, very quick. We're pretty much... Um, Removed all the imperfections off this sword. Nothing too serious. Bit of 2000 grit sandpaper and we'll polish her up quite nicely. I've also done some research. When my chat says entering host mode, exiting host mode, I understand what that means. When I'm offline, um, apparently I can host other channels. So if I'm not online and a friend's online, uh, my stream could be used to mirror another free friend's stream. And since I haven't done that to anything um, or anyone's stream, it's just uh, forever dormant in uh, host mode. And then uh, once I'm streaming, it exit hosts mode because I'm uh, doing a show. And uh, other people that I may be friends with uh, can host me on uh, their channel. And that would be, uh, that's pretty awesome. Um, might happen more often in the future. Just need to go off camera to get some uh, bog roll. 
wipe her clean because uh, I don't want water to sit on it for too long. Um, hopefully in an hour or so time we will prime her. And just as a final check, I'm rubbing my finger down it. I feel a bit of a lump here. So we will uh, get rid of it. Uh, resin kits is something that you shouldn't fear. Just jump on it. Don't be afraid to mistakes. Um, build kits. I've uh, built two garage uh, figure kits. Uh, the first one came out really well, but that was because it was a uh, beautiful and uh, lovely cast fitting and sculpt. So I was very happy how uh, that came out. The second one was an older kit. Um, it was a Hatsune Miku. It uh, caused fitting and assembly problems. But um, it came out okay. It's not my best work, but it's presentable. I even uh, put it on uh, display. It could fall apart quite uh, easily. This one isn't a great kit, but since I've uh, attempted a few, I know what I'm looking out for. I was able to... Well, since I know what I'm looking for, I was uh, able to correct some mistakes, put a lot of effort in surface prep, I put a lot of effort in pinning and assembly, and this kit can stand on its own um, with just the pin. So I can assemble it with all the pins and the holes, and it can stand freely, not fall over, and it doesn't even need any glue. Some bits will be glued. I have decided to put some uh, magnets in the head and some other components so it can be dismantled and reassembled. This would make it really easy to uh, disassemble, wrap it in bubble wrap, and put into storage or transport for competitions and stuff. So it's not going to take a lot of space up when it's uh, not on display. And uh, I think uh, that's a very good idea. It's a bit tricky. I understand some commission modelers do that. Um, I don't intend to do any commission stuff, but because I've got a lot of models, some on display, some not, might work out beautifully. So we've just uh, saved this sword. Um, the priming was terrible. Now it's uh, half primer, half uh, back to bare resin. It's going to be resprayed. I've got some Mr. Surfacer 1500. That should be sufficient as uh, the finish is good. It just needs something for uh, paint to etch on. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to inspect each component and see if they need any 2000 grit sand. Um, 2000 grit sandpaper uh, treatments. If there's any small dust, lumps, hair, anything like that. And uh, buff it so it could be beautifully smooth and nice. Might uh, have a bit of a beverage, a bit of a smoke. Not moving. Cheers. Mango drank and smoke. Awesome. Um, now, if I remember, the hair had some sort of weird shit on both sides, uh, putty showing. So here, I did a little putty work, and it's a bit rough, and it looks absolutely terrible. It'll come out in the paint. And there's also a, a rough nub mark there. Um, might need to get a, a knife for that. Oh, fuck, I don't know where my knife is. Ah, there it is. At least I'm within shot with everything. I uh, love the little webcam. So there's some things you just can't see until you put some primer on it. There it is. So there's just a bit of a nub mark there, probably from casting or something. We'll sharpen the paintwork, bit of sanding. And it's practically gone. Looks a lot better now. What I'm very concerned is uh, the top uh, bit there. That looks absolutely appalling. 
so we're going to sand that down absolutely flat and the very top of that will be reprimed it's just going to be a couple of passes with the airbrush one two three done fantastic i want to thank um while i'm doing the stream uh darkness d42 is auto hosting me thank you very much for that uh the effort is much appreciated so we will clean up uh this uh, little rough bit make it nice fat it's uh a bit of putty we're going to conform it to the resin so it looks like one piece and when uh, that's reprimed and painted no one will even know it's been uh, modified repaired or fixed there you go I have to admit I really like this new setup I can see what I'm doing on both cameras I can see myself and I can see the chat. It's just working very well. So this little bit here is done. I can feel it. I don't feel anything raised. I don't feel anything rough or bumpy. If you want to sand really, really quickly, um, don't ever be afraid of using very, very thick, uh, coarse grit sandpaper in ruining your work as long as you keep sanding down to a finer and finer and finer um, consistency and grit it should come out quite nicely after um, just even a little bit of uh, micro filler in your primer um, I like to go all the way up to um, 120 grit and just apply a little pressure and the higher the grit the more pressure you can chuck on it and then when you've got 2000 grit you can really polish as hard as you want but if you're polishing on top of paint and primer you just go a bit lighter and you can get rid of any bumps or raised detail or anything that's undesirable in the finish. Not the surface, the finish. And it just comes out quite nice. So at the moment, the whole bit of hair, I'm polishing with 2000 grit. So there was one or two tiny bumps. It's going to be nice and smooth when I put the layer of paint on. It's uh, going to be like it was never even um, a shit attempt at uh, priming occurred. And uh, polishing paint and primer and whatnot can only occur when uh, the paint's completely uh, dried and hardened. You cannot uh, polish um, paint that's skinned or only the surface is hard but underneath is wet or puttied or whatever because you're just going to scrape the uh, dried skin and expose the putty and uh, just leave all sorts of ungodly marks and scratches and um, a terrible texture. So most of the surface doesn't have to be reprimed, it's just polished, it's just nice and smooth. The inner um, bit has been liquid masked. I might just polish or sand a bit more there's just one little bit that I've got a tiny bit of concern about just sand that out polish it that is absolutely lovely now this isn't too bad there's one bit that can be neatened up a bit and there's uh, some sort of weird grittiness here between hair follicles. That was easy enough to remove. That was probably my fault. Some dust or crap settled on it while I was painting. The rest of it's pretty good. Bit of uh, glue gunk there. Give that a bit of a sand. So that's going to need a little more primer later. It's going to be a quick pass. Nothing serious.
I'll try not to move my hands too weirdly to cause the autofocusing, but uh, not too apologetic because when you hold it still and see it, you can see the finished result. And then when my hands are going all wild and crazy, you know that it's the sort of motion that's uh, being applied. So this is about 300 grit sandpaper that I'm uh, going on. So lifting a bit of primer is not a big issue. Okay, so we will do some polishing. And we'll dry it down. This is back of the head, so it's not going to be too noticeable. Um, and this is actually a pretty decent uh, primer attempt, so can't complain too much. The hair I might paint tonight. I'm more concerned about uh, areas that needs to be masked, so that needs to be painted now. Other areas that just need one kind of paint, whatever, that could be done anytime. Um, I want to get this done in two weeks, so I really need to focus on parts that uh, require paint, mask, paint, mask. And there's some parts I can see that's going to require three to four coats of <coughs> masking. That's going to be definitely um, a huge uh, pain in the ass. There's uh, a brass peg here. Um, when all the painting's done, I'm probably going to just... Uh, Sand it a bit so the paint comes off, the fits better. And we've got really big holes drilled in here a while ago. So we can uh, rig it quite nicely. And uh, have a lot of ease by holding the peg and airbrushing. Wipe down some of the follicles and whatnot. It's nice and dry. So that is. Shit. Oh well. I got the flesh. Flesh sort of can pick up all sorts of, uh, it's a very light colored like white or your yellows or anything like that. If there's any imperfection, it will stand out like dog's balls, lumps and stuff. It's meant to, um, being an anime character, it's, uh, they're these absolute perfect godly, no, um, body issues. They've, they've, they've got no moles, no pimples, nothing. They're just absolutely perfect, flawless uh, beans. So when the eyes are slightly crossed or there's a bit of texture or a lump here and here, um, it's going to really disturb uh, people when they uh, look at it. It's going to make it look a bit funny and uh, weird. So it doesn't hurt before you apply uh, the flesh. Just give it a bit of a 2000 grit rub down. I uh, paint the th flesh nice and thickly, and uh, in the event that even during the paint coats that uh, you still get a hair or a particle or a dust bit or whatever, every layer, if you put it clear and you give uh, the surface just a very light buff, sort of like when you just, uh, I don't know, rubbing your eye, you don't want to put too much pressure. That's the same thing. You're just gliding across the surface while the sandpaper's wet. And then you just touch off your finger and you feel that it's really nice and smooth. There was a couple of bumps from dust or something. It's gone now. And that was just with the face. That was just a bit of rubbing here, there. 45 seconds of work. And in the long run, it's just going to produce a better finish. Time consuming when you consider all the parts and whatnot but very rewarding for the finish. And also if you're doing a gloss surface and you do a wet coat of paint and a few coats of uh, gloss and then you give it a 2000 grit, maybe go further and uh, 
polish it and sand it with higher grit, you can get a beautiful, nice, deep sheen finish as long as the preparation is all there. And that's the difference when you look at the sheen and you can see if it's frosted and it's just either a really sharp, intense line from light reflecting onto it or if it's just sort of all frosted over. So you can see that the head's got a really sharp sheen. This isn't a sharp. We can make it a bit sharper just by polishing it. And uh, even if you don't have to, you don't see any imperfections, probably doesn't hurt because there is uh, some uh, rough or texture going on that the human eye can't see. And just giving it a quick rub down like this never really hurts anybody. And then you do that, paint, clear, sand, paint, clear, sand, paint, clear, sand, and you get an absolute wonderful finish. Just be very patient, take your time, don't rush any of the steps or put multiple layers of different color paint and then you sand and there's a lump and you remove the lump but the lump has a color that's underneath and then you got a spot that's a different color and that's just shit and if you're doing gradient stuff and whatnot and you're doing a coat like you do one color you do a gradient you do a coat it's a bit of a risk but you can take the risk just don't lay down really, really, um, well, when you're laying thin coats, thin it because you thin the paint and not because you're thinning it by lowering the PSI, pulling back and dusting on and doing uh, orange peel. Apply wet, not dry. And if you apply too dry, it sort of builds up, the gradient builds up in speckles and not so much just a, a fluidless uh, transition. And even though that looks good on some of my military stuff that's a, um, a matte finish or mecha stuff and whatnot, doesn't really cut it in something like this. Though you will make those mistakes for your first few projects and then you pick it up and like now you're probably thinking, I don't know what the fuck Alan's going on about. And then you do a few projects and you do some sanding and polishing and airbrushing and whatnot and then later on just a penny drops and you go, ah, oh, that makes sense. Or maybe just make sense straight off the bat and you're lucky. Sometimes I think, oh, I could cut a corner there, and then I go, oh, I can't. You also notice at some points there are holes in bits of flesh or other areas that just seem really weird and out of place and just terrible, and you'll see them in my work in progress and whatnot. That's because uh, this is a multi-layered kit. You'll see from the work in progresses um, that there's many layers of armor and detail and talismans and all these sort of things. Because I don't care if this is a cast off or not where I can display it half naked and I can display it in armor. I only care if it's in full armor. Um, I put holes in extra places so everything just clicks into place and it doesn't glue later. Because gluing painted surface on painted surface, you're relying on the strength of the paint on the primer on the surface and not uh, material on material contact. But instead of painting or gluing on top of paint or material, it's just a pin. There's a deep hole, there's a deep peg, slots in, assembles a bit like a, a Lego kit or a Gundam Snap model. So uh, that's the first time I've ever done that. And it's been uh, working for me uh, very, very well. I'm extremely happy with the outcome. I'll dry this uh, off a bit. I was a bit worried about some of the texturing and whatnot when I was uh, spraying last night, but now when I'm polishing and looking at it, it's a lot better than I uh, vaguely remember, so I'm pretty happy. Uh, this is a big piece of uh, flesh. Uh, there was a bit of paint that uh, drooped here. So at this point, there's a, um, a little heavy buildup and there's just a bit of um, a drop mark, which is uh, definitely uh, poorly done on my behalf. Funny thing with a lot of modelers when they do a work in progress and they build and they make a mistake and then they revert the mistake and they never include that in their work in progress. I like to include my mistakes to show that, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm not far from being a, a, a good modeler. I'm not a great modeler. I'm not a, an amazing modeler. I'm, I'm competent. That's probably as far as I'll consider myself. I make a lot of mistakes and I sometimes repeat mistakes. 
but I think it's good to talk about how to resolve mistakes and work in progresses. So when you guys encounter the same mistakes, you have a rough idea how to go about it. And even sharing and posting um, bad models. Sometimes you will do a bad model and you just want to hide it or put it away or it's just coming bad during the work in progress. I think they're worthwhile uh, sharing, even though it um, attracts uh, negative criticism and whatnot. It's still a uh, learning curve. But, uh, yeah, this has come out quite smooth. Love the uh, laced um, detail. It's, it's pretty good. Too bad it's uh, hidden. But um, we'll spend a little uh, time painting it. Uh, due to all the lace and the string and whatnot, I've sort of wrapped rattle my head and again and again and again thinking fuck how I'm going to mask it, how I'm going to do this, how I'm going to do that, it's going to take so much time, it won't be seen and I've just come to the conclusion, fuck it, I'll hand paint the undies, um, one colour, won't even be uh, shaded or gradient or anything cause it's not going to be seen, just in case of that one weirdo that looks up, so if it's just all flesh, it's just weird, it feels incomplete, at least I know it's completed. But I don't want to put too much effort, as long as it's neat and nice. Why well, this thing's got a big ass? This is a good thing. <laughs> I would like to get a lewd model by whoever sculpted this. Uh, the details, the curves, uh, the lines in the midriff and whatnot are quite nice. Very sexy. Unlike other anime characters, this isn't exactly portraying like a 14-year-old girl or something. It's... um. It's quite a uh, maturish figure. Well, I think the show does depict them as being high school or something, but this is sort of like, you know, the body of um, a MILF or something. So, Or a curvatured, um, fully matured woman. But, uh, yeah, fucking anime is weird that way. Fucking can't get your head around it. This is why I don't buy into the whole thing of um, the waifus and people, you know, going, I like this character, this character's best, that character's best, that girl's nice, and dating this character, whatever. It's, it's strange as shit. Take the piss out of them and whatnot, but it's really weird. Uh, there's a scene, this is, this is terrible, I don't even want to, there's a bit of a scene here that I haven't seen before until there's primer on it. And, uh... I wish I did this off camera, but oh well. We'll get it out there because unfortunately, looking straight down, it is uh, very, very visible. And the paint's going to make it stand out. So we're going to have to sand that out. And polish her up. There we go. That's what we want. I hope this is not too lewd by um, Twitch's standards. Don't know. I suppose we will find out. <laughs> kind of man suddenly banned because he's sanding the beaver out of a figure or something. Uh. But there we go. The uh, skin and surface is beautifully smooth. Being primer, um, lacquer based. When lacquer paint makes contact with lacquer um, thinner, it's activated, it becomes wettened. And when you spray lacquer on lacquer, it just uh, sort of moistens and wettens uh, the layer to a putty state, not a liquid state. So it's not going to mix with top paint. And just paint bonds upon paint upon upon paint, and it just becomes the one surface, not multiple layers of surfaces gluing on each other like uh, a laminar um, wood, but more so there's the one solid um, piece. So future uh, painting will come nicely. Uh, I might do one more layer of polish because I'm just looking at the sheen of the um, curves and whatnot. And it looks good, but uh, it can afford to be a little more shinier and a little more smoother. And even though the midriff will be completely uh, hidden, it's good practice of uh, getting an ideal finish. 
So I'd like to do very clean models, have them all shiny and polished and whatnot. Occasionally, not often. I like my mecha, my tanks, my armor. I like them dirty and trashed and all that. But to weather well, you have to do a clean build, and then from a clean build, you uh, weather. And then you can have all sorts of beautiful, nice weathering effects and not just weather intensely in some areas to hide mistakes that you've made. And in the end, that's uh, the goal of uh, someone that makes weathered models. Not hide mistakes and put weather in there because you have to, but wherever you want because the models are clean and perfect. Or the finish is as perfect as one can achieve with what they have access to. Uh, total perfection is a myth. It's not a thing at all. So, yeah, this is absolutely wonderful. There we go. Beautifully polished. So this is going to take onto some flesh paint nicely. Okay. Fuck. This piece of resin is very heavy, so rigging it's a bit of a an issue. It's probably uh, the heaviest uh, piece of resin in the whole kit. So luckily, it's um, below the belt. It was top heavy, that would be a bit of a shit. And I don't want it to be falling as I'm painting because I'm going to get dust and shit all over it. Awesome. Um, that's about... Fuck. That's about half of the shit polished. E cigarette fell. Now we've got the big amount of bits, the big tray. So I painted this last night, and this didn't even get any um, the polish treatment. I will very lightly rub it down in case there's any bumps. With 2000 grit, of course. Um, the fleshy bit I'll probably uh, put a little more emphasis on, because if I lift uh, a bit of paint to primer, that doesn't matter too much. Some lovely back detail. There we go. So this um, was uh, very carefully primed, wet uh, coated, so there was no bumps, knowing that I was going to paint it that night. And then I, uh, I've done a lot of heavy sanding on the breasts. They were re-sculpted um, with uh, automotive putty. And you can tell that being glossy, you don't see, there are small pit holes and scratches, but generally it's, um, mostly ignored from your point of view at least due to my method of uh, 800 grit or sorry 120 grit all the way to 2000 grit sanding so even though it's very coarse if you keep going up um, you can make uh, a surface that's uh, good enough for even a uh, polished fine um, paint and if I just did one more coat of putty and then started about 400 and then worked my way up to 2000 all those little speckles and whatnot will be gone. Um, I'm not too worried because the chest plate's going up the um, front of it. Uh, the sides um, are going to be visible. And they're um, a lot more well presented. So with airbrushing, what I did was I primed it. I coated everything in yellow. And then um, I picked the bottom bits and under the breasts with uh, a brown paint. 
and then sort of like a fleshy uh, tan color. I highlighted some of the top areas, a bit of line there and whatnot, and it just gives it um, a bit of uh, light shading and realism, and it just looks all right instead of just a, a flat color. If you just have a flat color like uh, this that I'm working on, the face, the midriff, the arms, is just nothing interesting. Even though there's detail there, you can't see it. It's washed out by light. You're not relying on just uh, folds of detail. You also have to accent them with uh, color and paint. So that's a bit interesting, just a demonstration of uh, theory with uh, something that we have. And we've got a leg here that I also did. Um, bit of a rough surface. So we're just going to just rub it lightly with some sandpaper and get it all nice and smooth. And then eventually what's going to happen is everything will be masked off and then I'll paint uh, this area uh, brown and mask it off further and paint the armor, armor color and mask it off again and this will be all brass or copper or some crap like that. Lots and lots of layers of masking, it's insane. And then there's like masking around here, so all this can just strip off. And it can just uh, peg in where it needs to peg. Dry it a bit, peg it up. And this bit we will probably paint tonight. I'll definitely paint in this tonight. We'll paint it uh, black. And when we paint black, it's talked about. Uh, well, I didn't actually talk about it live yet. It's uh, in a video that I've recorded that hasn't been released. Uh, when you want to achieve black, don't actually use black. Use a really, really dark green or dark blue or dark gray or whatever. If you want to shade that bit, and you can shade it with actual black later, and it can look effective. If you paint something black and you want it even darker, can't go darker. It's impossible. It's something uh, Mark Carlyle, um, multiple winner of the Australian Gunplay Builders World Cups, taught me. And uh, that I've uh, absorbed into uh, my teachings and uh, my theory when I model as well. I uh, do agree on him uh, strongly about that. And the effect looks uh, very effective. That's uh, beautifully polished. <laughs> okay, this. is okay. There's nothing I can do with that. This could use some polishing. It's not polishing something that's not very exciting to watch, but it's something that people don't really need know how to do it unless they've seen it done or talked about. And then you try it yourself, and then you have the idea of how much pressure you apply. Polishing and sanding, every body has their own way and method of attempting it. And then you get the idea of how strong and uh, nimble your fingers are, your understanding, all that sort of jazz. Now with the armor, um, I'm not going for a polished aluminium look or anything like that, or a steel look. It's going to be all rusted and decrepit and disgusting and stuff. Lots of uh, character and shading and whatnot. So the uh, surface doesn't have to be perfect and shiny. Um, the source material shows it to be like a very deep, high gloss black. And if you screw up the painting, it's not going to come out nicely like that. Um, I don't have to rely on that, so I'm pretty happy about that, but I'll still make precautions that if I was to attempt something like that, that that finish can still be achieved if mines are changed, 
which I'm pretty, uh, my heart is pretty set on what sort of finish that I want with this project. Uh, polishing's almost done. I might do something on the base and give it a bit of texture and then we will move to masking then. A lot of fun, a lot of fun. Also found out going through my Twitch. I think Twitch has gone through some updates or something for like the second or third time. They've said my account is not verified. I have no idea what the hell that means. Um... All of my previous videos have been deleted, which is a bit of a shame. Some of them sucked. They were just me playing some background music and just working away and just interacting with a few friends and answering questions and stuff. Something that's not really worth keeping. Uh, the best streams I did under my dodgy regime of the laptop lived half closed so you could see the green matter, the strange angle, I kept. And they're on the PhD Manchild um, YouTube channel. So they can be rewatched if you really, really, really want to. And each of the really good uh, ones have also been posted on the McConaughey Man on Facebook. So if you dig back deep enough, you can find them. Um, these ones, any of these streams that are really good, uh, that will also go to the PhD Man Child and just stay there as um, archived content. As Twitch can really not be trusted in keeping it and there might be some good lectures or talks or demonstrations or something that really should probably be uh, kept and eventually one day what I'll do is I'll go in the PhD Manchild um, channel and download all those videos uh, on my hard drive so they're kept in case something does happen to YouTube in the future that the content can be posted elsewhere and uh, shared in future if anything good of it has come. Um, some people upload videos on YouTube, delete the, any trace of it on their computers, and that's that. I keep multiple copies of every video, uh, the material used to create the videos unedited on a few external hard drives. So if anything does occur to my content, it's all backed up and saved. It's many, many years of work. It would be heartbreaking if all those years of work uh, have gone missing. It will still be pretty bad if it just suddenly goes offline. Uh, but... Um, at least there is a record of it uh, in my collection, and at least I know that um, I can re-upload it at some point. Now here is an example of a pretty bad mistake. Uh, there is either a drop of paint, a drop of glue, a drop of something. And I got a bit zealous and uh, panicked because of some fish eye, and I um, applied too much primer, and I flooded bit of detail. What I'm going to do is uh, with the back of my blade very carefully I'm going to re-scribe the seam and I'm just doing it really lightly I'm just scratching it in And once it's deep enough and I've got a channel and it goes across, I can do it a bit deeper or apply more pressure. You see, now it draws a lot easier. So each swipe, once you feel comfortable that there's a bit of a channel, you can go a bit harder and a bit harder and a bit harder and remove a bit more material. And then we've gone from a flooded bit of detail with too much primer in it to back to its original resin channel. Now there's a, uh, a lump of primer or glue or something there. I've got no idea what it is. I'll probably use 200, 300 bit sandpaper. Get rid of it. Sand it down to nothing. Sand around the seam as well, uh, very lightly for any scratches that if you've uh, coursed off a bit. But I'm going to just uh, target. 
So another mistake I made was um, I dropped this bit and uh, this uh, bit of um, bow just snapped off and lost. Don't know where the fuck it went. And I was like, Jesus. And I'm thinking, can I get away with displaying it with no uh, bow? No, I can't. It'll stand out that I broke apart and I just couldn't be fucked to do anything about it. How I fixed it was I got some um, one mil styrene. It's a bit thicker than the other bow, but it wasn't too noticeable. Sand it down a bit to a similar thickness. I cut it to the same thickness and length and just super glued it in. Uh, at just a quick glance, um, it was a bit curved. It was easy to curve. I curved it around my finger and hold it for about two, three minutes, and it just came out as a bit curved, not as curved as the other pieces. But because it's a flow, a free flowing um, bit of uh, lace or tie, it's just not noticeable. And by a quick glance, when it's all painted, done, and said, none of you will ever notice that that was even a mistake. Yet, if I just left it broken off, um, yeah, that'd be pretty bad. So that glue build-up area is flat, and uh, I've sort of um, lost the panel line again because we sanded the material around it. And sometimes with kits with like really thin panels, when it's primed, I like to go back and uh, just re scribe out the uh, panel lines again just so when I put um, washes and whatnot down it and paint it it's more noticeable And it's just a very, very, very delicate process. Time consuming. Not hard. Just be mindful of the pressure. Polish around the area and whatnot. This is a method I've learned from um, Dosh, uh, Josh from Australia, who won the last Gunpla Builders World Cup. And he'd done his um, amazing kits with all the panels and cutouts and whatnot. And I got a chance to talk to him in Sydney and um, exchange some methods and whatnot. His techniques are absolutely wonderful. He does a lot of tutorials uh, in pictorial uh, manners and he does talks and whatnot. But just some of his stuff, uh, you just really need to um, get it from uh, the horse's mouth. <sighs> and uh, what he's achieved and done. Um, I'm going to try to replicate at some point. But right now, I'm purely focusing on this resin kit. So there we go. What was a bit of a mistake, and if I kept painting and going, would it just kept looking worse and worse and worse and snowballed? Now has been completely rectified. And with just a tiny dust on of uh, super light, um, 1500 uh, primer, no one will ever know. It's hidden. It's a secret. It's between us. Okay, which I actually needed to remove this at some point and uh, put it on pegs as well. So I forgot to do that at some stage. I need to do it to the other foot as well. Because uh, it will give me access to paint some of these details and wash and weather and whatnot. And then I'll glue it permanently in later. So. Going a bit quiet every time I do a pass of uh, the panel lines because I don't want to scratch go in the wrong direction, which I just have just then twice. 
then I'll polish it out because it's a case of two steps forwards, one step backwards, remove some material. All bad luck. But yeah, that came out good. And done. Very happy with that. Very, very happy. Too easy. We got the chest plate now. It came out quite nice, so uh, that can just be polished. It was modified. I ran putty down in there and there, so it was quite thick. I drilled a hole all the way through, put it on the chest plate and drilled holes further into the actual chest so it fit quite well. We could see what I meant about fitting and whatnot. Can you see? It doesn't want to fall off and you can see what's uh, exposed and what's not. And the paint hasn't scratched off so that's uh, a good sign. All this chest plate needs is a polish. Make it all nice and shiny. It's a nice looking chest plate. It's a shame in the original design it's covered by the arm and everything. And it's meant to pop off to show off the breasts. Much rather have this project dignified. I'll just keep another lewd project for the sake of lewd and um, a showcase of sexuality. This one's about violence and medieval and whatnot. Combat, the detail and the beauty and the armor. Yeah, this, uh, I thought I might have put too much primer on this and it might have streaked somewhere. Uh, it looks like it's self leveled. I came out very lucky there. And with primer, um, I demonstrated in the video the other night that I just do like a dust coat, a dust coat, and then I build up with a wet coat and make it nice and thick, but not too thick that it floods some of the really fine detail. And this gives me flexibility that a tiny amount can be removed during polishing. Looks okay, but I want a bit more of a sheen, so we'll do another round. There we go. It's nicely done. Got a bit of a sheen. Coat of paint, coat of gloss, and it'd be it'd be okay. And then from there you'd go four thousand, six thousand, some of the polishing compounds, and that would be the first step to do something quite uh, pretty. I'll only have this as a satin gloss, though. Uh, and that was over here. That's all right. That doesn't need any work. 
This needs a little polishing. A bit of an arm. Lots of detail. Just be careful when there's lots of detail in your polishing that you don't focus your polishing on an edge because then you're just digging into the material and it's only going on the raised bit, not anywhere else. So fold it over and uh, put the flat on the flat of the other bit and take your time on getting that. If you just put your finger over and just try to do it all in a couple of swipes, all you're doing is just picking off uh, the most raised detail. You want to be focusing on the flats where the inf um, imperfections are most likely to collect uh, the edges are uh, very rarely that little dust particles or whatever will settle there. Assembling this arm was pretty crazy. This is something like um, three parts <laughs> in what I'm holding in my hand right now. And you'd think it'd be even in more parts with just how much detail and layer of armor and whatnot there is. There we go, that works well. The paper that I'm using is just toilet paper and it just absorbs any uh, water because I, since I'm going to airbrush this fairly soon, um, if you just have any water that creeps under panel lines, detail, whatever, you put paint over it, it's just going to trap the water and move the water around or bust the paint and more paint will go over it and it'll just sit on the water and not the paint and it's going to create a terrible texture and all sorts of uh, bad news just good that even though you're going for a bit of paper um, don't worry about being conservative in that regards uh, or environmentally conscious or whatever because if you ruin your paintwork, you're just going to be wasting paint product resources and uh, money, time, all that sort of stuff. Sometimes good to just be really, really vigilant and um, just make sure it's dry. All right, that's done. This didn't need a lot of work. Um, polishing is almost done. I pretty much just got one last leg and then we'll do some texture on the base and then we will move on to masking. So I've got uh, that bit. It's a mirror to the other bit. That's why I like mirroring shit. <laughs> There's a couple of uh, scratches here from sanding. Um, that could have been improved a bit. But uh, since um, that's going to be a bit of a uh, flat, not gloss surface, it's not going to be noticeable later, especially that color. Polish it a bit to hide it a bit further. And uh, then, yeah, the painting stage will pretty much um, eliminate that. So that's not too much of a problem at all. If I was going for gloss, that would have to be uh, sanded. Um, from a hot, um, a coarser grit down to a finer grit, not just the polishing that I'm doing now. There we go. So with this piece, the painting plan will be, uh, the flat bit will be brown leather, sort of like Brigadine armor. And I'm going to paint it brown, two tones. Uh, put a gloss, let it dry, and then mask off just these metal bits. And then the metal bits will be painted uh, grey colours uh, for pitching. And there will be some salt weathering and then metallic cleaned up. And then um, I'm going to dust on a bit of uh, bronze and exhaust and other stuff to just have spot rust. Uh, top coat it, remove the mask, and then there will be washes and other weathering methods applied. And it should create a pretty interesting effect. Last bit to polish. And just like the other leg, uh, this one also has had a, a mistake. There was a bit too much paint buildup. And for some reason, this uh, panel line is also wiped out a bit. So... We've got an imperfection there. We've got a paint build up here. Paint build up here. And um, a panel line 
flooded. So we'll deal with the panel line first. That way, yeah, so we're just coursing down with the back of the blade. First few swipes, you want to use the sharp of the blade, so you're coursing a path of travel. When you look really close, you can see that there's little bits of uh, dust and debris and whatnot. Wipe it occasionally, because if it goes back in, it might cause you off track. And then back of the blade. Move to some uh, pretty gritty sandpaper. And then we'll get rid of that build up a primer. Since it's gotten wet, it's a bit harder to see. Uh, I might have to go on a break for about five minutes. And then we'll keep going. So please stay tuned. Shit. And I will be back very shortly. We shall put on some jazz music while we wait.
Well, speaking of great Australians, ACT Australian of the Year, Alan Tone is in. He's a former Raider. Now he's a youth mentor. He uh, picks a very big box on your list, Tim. On the very point he made, he's, uh, he's this apprenticeship himself. Of course, he's worked with Cambridge Youth and in the adult jail here. We are very highly interested in sort of Indigenous incarceration, particularly in our youth detention centre. And he's developed a mentorship and rehabilitation program for offenders in youth and adult jails. He's a great Aussie. He's got extensive wit, and he's on the program today. And I'm so excited for Alan. Last year, he had uh, David Morrison, who was the ACT Australian of the Year, former Chief of Army, who went on to become Australian of the Year. Uh, I'm just pleased that, and I don't know what you think about the awards, I think the Australian of the Year is very important. I think all of the categories are important. But we've, we've got to ask ourselves, do we need to focus on an Australian of the Year? Uh, we've got our senior, we've got our young Australian, we've got Australian of the Year, we've got our citizen of the Year. Do we need to focus and look at that individual male and female and say, hey, you're a great, you're a great cheerleader for what we believe in in Australia. Uh, Alan Tung on the program today, and a big congratulations to ACT 2017 Australian of the Year. Melbourne Cup Day, how big is it in Canberra, Tim? <laughs> yeah, what a shot. Yeah, mate, I'm so happy because um, Barb Joseph is one of Australia's most successful um, trainers. Her father has won more things before um, Smith Waterhouse, Dave Waterhouse, who, of course, we know uh, 20 days. She's the best. Good morning, Gabe. She'll be up early listening to Australia overnight out there at Flemington from the woods too. But Barb Joseph has got seven uh, horses in the eight races here at Thoroughbred Park in Canberra. We've got thousands expected to be out in the 17 degrees, uh, beautiful temperature we've got. And Barb is a real uh, a real backup here. She has been training with us for years. We've had a couple of great things under her belt. I'm really pleased Barb's going to be on the phone. She's going to give us our, our tips. And we were doing a bit of a ring round up at the Capitol, mate. And Jim, we got some early tips from, uh, from the poly. So I know they're all over the place, you know, at the moment. Yeah. But you know what I love? The public service club to buy into a tweet. We rang ATO and ACES because, you know, you've got to get on the by organisations to find out how they're thinking that the, uh, the Melbourne Cup uh, field is looking. Big tips from ACES and ATO. They were some secret number, number 21 yes. in the Melbourne yes. Cup. Secret number. And, of course, you can't say Hansi Albanese and Christopher Pine. Um, both of them are back in number 16. Beautiful romance. So the yeah. classic romance where they're all selling together, is it, mate? So nobody from ACES went for excess knowledge? Oh, uh, well, no, that'd be overstating things because you always need an excess strategy, mate. Just that thing you've got excess, uh, you've got excess knowledge. Uh, you might run into a bit of trouble. But big good luck to every, every jockey and all the interest today in the race that does stop the nation. And boy, that was a big topic on the show yesterday. What has stopped the nation in the past? And uh, JFK, uh, Diana Jeff, uh, Carol Holt going missing at Chelsea Creek was a big one that stopped the nation here in Canberra. Uh, so that was a cracker. Uh, a big show ahead. Guess which, um, which Australian uh, Hall of the Vote was released today? Uh, how far back are we going? Oh, we're going, um, we're going back to 19, 1993. Why do we say higher or lower? Can you make Which, which, which poll of the nose was released today? I don't know. I'm going to say 20. Uh, lower? Uh, 15. <laughs> higher? No. It was a $10 note. We did that. With a $10 note, and of course, the place is saying, Mary Gilmore, and that case, and I had a $10 poll of the nose. And... I reckon, I reckon they're great. We get exported that technology to a number of countries all over the world. In fact, Paul Keating really empowered um, and spoke when he was Prime Minister. He really got right on the program and got a number of, I think, uh, Pacific Island nations to buy their currency from us. That was a great idea. So we'll give him some money anyway. We won't just buy them. Uh, well done. Yeah, good on you, Paul. Uh, so that's, that's an anniversary of that. Um, yes. Now, speaking of other anniversaries, Peter, speaking of John. We have got cracker, cracker Australian birthdays today. Tony Collette, I, I just love her because she's 44. Where else? Hello, Tony. Hello, Tony. Hello, Tony. We're back. I'm very sorry for that.
So we're going to finish polishing up this uh, boot. And then we shall move on to um, texturing the base. This kit's been a lot of fun to work on. I've uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. There's a whole series of um, of these um, from the animation and the people that uh, sculpted this kit. Really, really appreciated the uh, work behind it. It's pretty awesome. So... Give it a dry for reasons that we already know. So I can tell you, I made that mistake a few times, <laughs> and uh, it won't. Oh, I won't say it won't happen again, but I don't ever want it to happen again. And another thing that a lot of people ask: uh, why grey primer? for a resin kit. I use grey primer for everything and then from that there's base coats and then from the base coats we uh, work our way down to uh, it's just a figment of my imagination. Then from base coats we work our way to the surface coats and whatnot. Um, grey primer is just really good for finding faults and uh, just at least I know that it's been primed. If you put prime it in white or some other color, you don't know if it's the old plastic color or whatnot. It sort of signifies when I abandon the project and pick it up again that roughly where I uh, was at last time. It's really good for scratch building. So it's a uh, great primer, scratch build, sand, all this other stuff. Prime. There we go. So that's all polished. We shall work on this. Um, I need. We'll need this for later. No, wrong one. Why did I grab for that? Oh, at least you know what that is. Uh, fuck. Ah, there it is. To me, the texture paints. And a brush. This is a good brush. So what we got with this base is a bit of a chrysanthemum flower, a few katanas, some texture. Now what I'm going to do is just accent this texture further with this uh, texture paint. And what I want to do is in some of these uh, panels and whatnot, just build up the texture even further. Now, just using uh, either really cheap brushes or old brushes because this texture paint does uh, kind of ruin the points and whatnot of your brush. And there's some points of uh, this uh, diorama that is uh, quite um, 
smooth and some texture. The texturing doesn't look that good. It's probably uh, lost its um, finesse from um, multiple castings. We're going to re-bring that back to life. Uh, dioramas get like that when they're cast in resin. You get the nice complex shapes, but you lose the finer points of uh, the texturing. And texturing, adding texture again, it's pretty easy. It just takes a bit of time. And that's what we're going to do. And since that, uh, I'll normally use sand and other things, and I actually might still use sand in uh, the little crevices there. But for small stuff, this is perfect. This texture paint is also really good for cast iron effects on uh, armor and mecha and other things. Looks really cool. I'm a big fan of texture paint. Though I don't use it anywhere near enough. The texture paint is also another thing that just solves all problems. Also, just dry brush a bit of it on the uh, flat surfaces. But in the low surfaces, we build it up. And this will just take a little while to color in the uh, areas that I desire to be colored in. Uh, I'll color in the side later with a bigger brush. I might need a larger brush as well. I'll just do the outlines of all the areas with uh, this brush and then I'll use a larger brush to color in. I think that's uh, fair, fair to do. Another thing with texture paint is you can build up with it and then just smooth it out, which I might do that instead of using a larger um, brush. That might work out well. Okay, so we've got a large little area there, and then we'll just pile on more texture paint and just move it around until it looks all like um, undisturbed earth and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Though when you build it up, it does take a while for it to uh, dry. little uh, holes and just put it in there and with uh, washes and paint and whatnot it'll come out quite nicely texture paint can be a lot of fun because um, it's not so much a focus on being neat but creative and since I was being uh, neat with the polishing and whatnot, which is good to sort of go out and um, have a little fun with this. And then we're going to get into masking. And then masking, we're going to have to just shut the fuck up and focus. Here, I just have a bit of creative freedom to just go a bit wild. And away we go. So we can see that there's now definitely a, a difference between the lower areas where there's texture and dirt and the upper areas where there's um, the smooth surface of the chrysanthemum and the katanas and the rims and all that sort of stuff. But there's a big difference now in um, contrast. Contrasting textures. And this will affect uh, the finish of it just by a little bit.
just uh, wipe off your brush from um, having too much buildup of texture or otherwise it would just be a little hard to get into some um, finer detail areas. Just build up some here. There we go. It's looking really good. Pretty happy about that. We'll do the outer rim too. Um, but first we'll just... I'll put a bit of putty between the swords as well to just give a little elevation. So at first I thought the sculpt of this base was a bit ordinary. But with just a bit of mucking around. It looks a lot nicer. And at least at elevation with putty, we don't have to use texture paint to elevate. Texture paint's not exactly cheap. This is like almost 20 bucks for this jar. And normally I would have just mixed it my own and stuff, but I was in um, Shizuoka in Japan. And they had a display uh, showing um, each texture paint. And I thought each texture paint was just different colors, but it was actually different textures as well. Some of them were coarser, some of them were finer. And I was uh, really impressed with this uh, little guide. So I thought, you know, when I go back to Australia, I'm going to uh, buy some texture paint and do a review. And I did exactly that. Got a video uh, on YouTube about this texture paint. And I want to buy the other ones because they've got some pretty interesting uh, textures. And I want to use them for more than just, uh, because of how subtle they are, I want to use them uh, more than just for diorama stuff by dry brushing them on surfaces and trying to replicate cast iron on uh, tanks and stuff. I think that would be very, very cool. Especially Gundams. Mecha, all that sort of stuff. Gunpla. Yeah, I'm very, very, very happy with this. So that's just slowly building up and coming together. Just put some up here. It's getting a bit unruly. So we're going to wipe our brush down a bit. And we'll just continually filling in these little areas. Still haven't decided what I'm going to paint this um, base. I think I'll be hand painted and just a little bit of, uh, yeah, I'll hand paint the base. And I'll just be a little uh, shading with the airbrush. And then a big focus on uh, washes and effects. Because since most of the project will be um, airbrushed, it would be a nice contrast to have a part of it that's going to be uh, painted. Got to make sure that... Oopsie... I'll fill the peg hole with... Um, texture and that's no good because uh, the peg holes needed for the figure to stick to the base also when the texture paint dries out a bit you can just add a bit of water it's uh, completely water soluble and water based
like working if it, when it's a bit thick. And then we will do the sides, but I will use a different brush. So a bit of multi-purpose thinner. This brush is nice and clean. It's got its point returned actually. So that's all right. And we'll use the wider bristle to save some time to paint the sides. Texture paint. And we'll go nice. This um, can be a bit hard to work with. It's getting it to stick to your brush and stick to the surface. It's not the stickiest of paints because there is uh, little bits of um, rubble and whatnot. Or what you can do is dry brush it on and just build it up in layers instead of putting it in large globs. That also works, but it also does more damage to your brush that way. Fine dabbing it on um, works a lot easier for me, at least. There's no real right or wrong way. It is a unconventional product. And you use it however you see fit. Beautifully done. Very happy with that. Um, shit, I don't have a plastic bag in here. There we go. Rubbish bin. We'll snap a quick photo. <laughs> And this can move on. Let's maintain and look after your equipment. Paintbrush is nice and clean. Mm. 
then it's put away. And now we shall do some masking. So this has been given 24 hours to dry and harden, and I've got some uh, Tamir thick tape here, which eventually will <laughs> need to get replaced. I've actually uh, really eaten through it. Fuck. And some scissors. What I'm going to do is I'm going to mask the right hand side of this figure. So the left hand half is going to be um, black. And instead of applying really, really long strips of masking tape everywhere, I like to apply small strips. Good tool is always um, toothpick. You try to get it in one position. No, no right or wrong way around masking, but there are ways that you can achieve it better. I find putting tons of little squares down and overlapium guarantees that there is no gap that uh, the paint's going to come through and uh, bleed anywhere. And then when you spray, you do a couple of uh, fine coats and then you do a wet coat on top of that to make sure that you seal the mask areas. Uh, masking and doing um, glossy coats of paint is uh, very, very challenging. And with anything, the more practice, the better you get at it. So pat it down. You also have to be very careful how you remove the mask so you're not scratching or damaging the paint as well. Also, never mask polyurethane-based paints, uh, your Vallejos and all that. Uh, that's, uh, you're going to have a bad time. There's a few tactics and smart ways to go around uh, masking. So since there's a, a large flat area here, you can afford... All the way down there. It's not very straight. So, where you position? It should be better if I actually start at the bottom and roll my way up top. Oh, that looks a lot better. Contour to any lines. Small gap, but I'll probably just use a crappy piece of that small gap. There we go, that's half done. And then we will do the other half, the back. The back will have to be a bit more neater and symmetrical because that's going to be very noticeable. 
And then what I'm going to do is all down the sides and stuff, we'll probably use uh, blue tack. And save uh, masking tape. <coughs> Okay. That actually uh, was interesting how it tore there. So all we really care is about the corsetti bit. Um, there we go. Uh, the rim, outer rim bit is going to be uh, painted metal. The flesh bit is going to be painted flesh. This is one of the bits that's going to be a lot of masking. When it's done, it's uh, going to be pretty sick. Cool. Cool, 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 cool. Um, I'll just have a few more strips, and then we'll uh, rip out the blue tack. I have to be very careful because I'm um, masking yellow. I have to make sure that I'm not um, not covering up any places because uh, the paint is also yellow. Okay, blue tack time. This blue tax a bit old and crappy. I'm going to buy some new stuff this week because I'm going to need um, quite a bit of it. But it's going to still do the job as long as we overlap. And we just stick down. Liquid mask also works quite well in other uh, areas and applications too. Big fan of liquid mask. Can be very hard to use, but use rightly, and the way you go. That's good to go. And so overspray won't affect anything, whatnot, but we're still going to be very neat and very careful. And we'll try to only paint on this half of the body um, and nothing there. And that should work out quite well. I'll just take a quick happy snap. That's good for painting. I'm going to have to skip out for just two seconds. I need to look at a bit of reference material that's in the other room. And then we're going to make a YouTube video. Another thing that when you're, mask, you're painting a mask area, when you're airbrushing, so if this is your airbrush needle, you want to tilt your part slightly so you're painting in this angle and not this angle. Because if there's any part that the mask is lifted, you're spraying underneath the mask, and that is uh, going to cause bleed and whatnot. If you spray on this half, generally, and if you just keep it uh, that way and not spray in that direction, 
it's uh, going over the mask and it can't really go backwards. It won't overspray inside. It won't leak inside. It's just a bit of an extra insurance or guarantee. Okay. So that's pretty cool. Be back. Okay, cool. So I know what I'm doing now. I know how to attempt it, so it's going to work out pretty well. Oh, this is going to suck. That's all right. Um, let's move some stuff around. We'll get into some... Video making. Welcome to another modeling video. This is Alan from the Makonomana YouTube with a, another model review. Today we're going to be reviewing and demonstrating the use of the Tamiya masking tape for curved lines to millimeters. This tape is designed specially to go around corners and whatnot and help prevent 
Bleed, as well as, uh, fuck, that was terrible. Let's delete that. We'll try again. Hello and welcome to another modeling video. This is Alan from the Mokana Man at YouTube with another model video. Today we will be reviewing the Tamiya masking tape for curved surfaces to millimeters. I wanted something quite thin. I'll be doing a tartan for a kilt or a dress. So we will uh, look into the use of that. Too easy. Get the uh, tripod out, and yeah, it's going to get a bit interesting. Um, we'll see anyone who watches this stream will also uh, watch the video. Our uh, little uh, slit has some extra instructions that may be uh, useful for our purposes. Um, cut using scissors, um, obviously. Do not stretch excessively. Uh, masking curves. Keep out of reach of children. Um, not for non-modeling uses. And confirm that the paint is fully dried and cured, which we will talk about. Do not leave uh, the masking tape on the surface for extended periods of time. I've got uh, theories and methods around that, so that's not a problem. Do not uh, dry paint using heat sources, obviously. So what we're going to do is we've got this uh, surface. It's painted in lacquers, and we put a clear coat over it. We're going to apply the mask, put paint, mask um, again, paint again. If we do leave it on there for a few days or whatnot, if it does get really well stuck and lifts any paint or any residue, because we have a fully cured uh, clear coat, it'll affect the clear coat and that can be buffed clear coat and whatnot and it won't actually affect the paint itself. Uh, I only recommend uh, the use of this tape on um, lacquers, enamels and uh, isopropic based acrylics such as uh, Tamir or Gunzi. Do not use masking products on polyurethane based paints like uh, Vallejo or um, Citadel as they sort of uh, shrink wrap around the model and not uh, etch on. Let's have a go. Now, ideally, the sides are sticky. Keep it in plastic as much as you can because it'll get fur and um, shit all over it. That's a bit of a, a red tag. And you want to try to touch the sticky components as uh, little as humanly possible and not reapply. What we're going to do is we're going to cut large strips and not work off the um, reel. And we will apply it on the surface and then uh, chop. What we're going to do is find roughly, th this is actually feels really thick. It's almost like embossing tape. 
what we're going to do is we're going to find where we want to stick it somewhere about here and we're going to just start laying it around and then filling in crescents with um, a bit of toothpick we just rub 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 place rub down rub down get into all the contours move around move around rub 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 and that's actually worked really really well I'm pretty impressed with this uh, product. It uh, seems to contour around pieces very, very easily. Um, we'll find out once we uh, put some paint on it. Yeah, this product, as you heard from um, the filming, this product's not too bad. So we'll just uh, keep going, keep wrapping paint around, or wrap, wrapping the tape around. There's already shit sticking to the sides of it. Man, I hate masking. I fucking hate masking so much. But the result in the end is so worthwhile. And mind you, this paint curves around surfaces like an absolute champion. Jesus. And when you just uh, rub it with your finger all the way across, it just flattens it without leaving folds. Probably just uh, mention that in the video. Another amazing thing is when I've wrapped this around and then rubbed my finger down it, instead of the uh, tape bunching up and leaving little creases or corners, it actually just ever so slightly stretches, contours to the surface, and it just keeps moving down. This product is actually uh, very well designed and is working quite well to our intended purpose. Uh, let's see when paint arm is applied and lifted if it looks good still. Yeah, it's excellent. Cannot complain whatsoever. Okay. Now, uh, there's a reason why we have a, a little surplus bit, because we want to have a bit of uh, spacing between each layer. Uh, no, probably a bit of a smaller gap. Don't like that. I'll uh, freeball it. Masking is definitely a pain. Nonetheless, I'm seriously impressed with this product. I'm going to buy all the... Um, sizes of the uh, Tamiya curve base tape and probably just use that for almost everything since um, you don't actually come across that many flat surfaces uh, for uh, masking and this just works like an absolute champion it's a little more expensive but um, so much easier to mask
So we'll just get the third stripe across. I'm also achieving this um, a little faster than I sort of expected. There we go. And then you push your hand across and you smooth it out. Smooth, smooth, smooth. Make sure that it gets into each contour. And there's just absolutely no gaps. This stuff is fantastic. I wish I jumped on this bandwagon so much earlier. Now we need to do three stripes at the bottom, and that's <laughs> going to be a, a bigger pain. So we'll do the three stripes on the other side first, and then we'll do a couple down there, and a couple down there. We'll see how we go. And then we'll uh, chuck some uh, red paint on this. Okay, and then we just contour and make sure that it's um, sticking to all the areas that it needs to. I can understand why you don't want to stretch this excessively because it needs to stretch a bit to get into all the panels and whatnot. Photos product, did I not? No, I didn't. Fuck. Sweet. It's looking good. Bottom halves are going to be really tricky to do. That's going to take a whole while. Add any further G. Let's try it.
Okay. Going in, going around, details and stuff. This is really hard. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to chop it here and then just continue it. Instead of doing it one piece, one piece is probably way too ambitious. And we'll use the back of my blade to onto it. Why did I have to do a tartan? <laughs> why, 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 why? Okay. And then we'll just cut a small amount and we'll just continue. No rush whatsoever. Okay. We use the back of the blade to flatten it down. Now we need to pull it out a bit so it doesn't move too far away from where we want it to be. That's looking really good. Can't say enough how glad I am I bought it. Sort of almost like sticky Teflon tape. Uh, sucks. Hate masking. Starting to get daylight too outside. This, um, Anyone that really enjoys masking is a sicko. <laughs> I might cut the stream shortly because uh, just me just grunting and looking at this and working in absolute silence and just applying tape probably cannot be that interesting.
So I've done it. I've done a strip. So the top bit will be three strips. The bottom bit will be two strips. And there'll be a couple of strips here and here. Like two, two. And then there'll be some red strips. And there's going to be yellow. And it's, it's going to be sick. Um, fuck. <laughs> I suppose I'll, uh, um, I suppose I'll thank you guys for watching at this stage. Thank you very much for watching. Um, we have a YouTube channel, The Makana Man, at YouTube. Uh, I post once a week, sometimes twice a week. We have a Patreon. It's a tip jar if you feel inclined to support what I do. It's the sort of thing that I'd like to do more often. Um, I'm not I'm never going to do this full time or anything, but uh, it gives me um, exposable uh, resources, so things can be bought to review, test, trial, educate myself and you guys, as well as um, create more tutorials and videos that I otherwise wouldn't have done because I couldn't quite afford it off my own uh, back. So if there's a certain product and stuff that's uh, useful and people want to learn about and um, they suggest it, I could go out and buy it and try it, even if it's not quite my style or something that I exactly want to do. But I'd be happy to invest in it because um, it's also a partial investment from you guys. We've got a Facebook. I'm very active on that. Uh, there's all sorts of interesting content as well as when I'm streaming on here, there'll be a link for that. There's uh, the PhD Manchild. Um, the best of these streams are going to go on there. And uh, as well as just other just fun content. There's also going to be... Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just about all of it. I've got a Thingiverse account when I do a 3D design. It goes up on there. Uh, I think that's about everything that I do. Yeah. Thank you very much for your support. If you've watched it, especially if you watch it all the way through. Um, not many people saw it live, but they'll be recording. You guys can check it out if you feel inclined. It's good fun. And if you have any questions, I always answer them um, in comment form, uh, whatever platform I'm on. That's about it. I'll uh, catch you guys later. I'll uh, keep working on this uh, crazy uh, project and on my video uh, as soon as I finish masking this uh, dress, which will probably take another half hour, hour or whatever. I'm going to um, do a bit of airbrushing in here. I want to paint uh, this black. I want to paint this black. I want to paint the hair. And I want to paint the bow tie and the dress. Anything else that I paint will be an absolute bonus. Catch you guys later. Thank you very much. And adieu.